today's message, there he is, a forgotten founding father. Say that with me, a forgotten founding father. What's his name? Noah Webster. Noah Webster. I mean, we got the dictionary. Where did it come from? What did he have to do with America? I thought he just wrote the dictionary. No. Listen, Noah Webster, a forgotten founding father, and you have to push me. Let's go. Here we go. That's me. That's a black Bible in my hand. Sets her on my left-hand part of my desk. Many of you have been in my office and have counseled you and stuff. You come by and seen me. Black Bible usually sits right there. What you don't see is what's in the right hand drawer, second drawer on the right hand side. It's this thing right here. It's that old tattered Webster's Dictionary. And I've said it for years. I use two things primarily when I put messages together. I use an old black Bible and I use a Webster's Dictionary. That's what I use. I do have some reference guides in case I get off the track sometime. I want to make sure I'm not being too goofy. All right? Uh, so, so I got some good study guides behind me. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a black Bible and a Webster's Dictionary. Amen? So we're going to talk about that Webster's Dictionary today a little bit. Who was this man? Who is that man who has that book in my second desk drawer? That's taught me so much over the years and helped me communicate the meaning of words to so many people. Noah Webster, Jr. He was born in West Hartford, Connecticut on October 16, 1758. His father was Noah, Sr. Now, his mother's name was what? Mercy. I like that. His father was primarily a farmer, though he was a deacon at a local congregational church. He was captain. Don't mess with him of the town's militia. And he was a founder of a local book society. Though Webster's father never attended college, he was intellectually curious and he prized education. His mother spent long hours, say long hours, long hours teaching little Noah and his other brothers and sisters spelling and math and music. Now at the age of six, Noah, little Noah, began attending a dilapidated one-room primary school that had been built by West Hartford's Ecclesiastical Society or church group. Many years later, he described the teachers as, say it with me, the what? <laughs> the dregs of humanity. That's what he thought about his early teachers there when he was in that little one-room schoolhouse. And he complained that the instruction was mainly in what? Religion. Religion. That's what little Noah thought. Keep looking. Webster's negative experience in primary school motivated him to improve the education of future generations. Can we thank the Lord for this man if you've got any education today? Say, come on. Any education. You thought you did it, didn't you? That's what we think about our country sometimes. We think we did it, or people in Washington think they did it. Are you kidding me? You're screwing it up half the time. Amen, say. People like this. You mean the education of high school, elementary school, middle school, going to college, Gary Clark? You mean there was a man named Noah Webster that played a part in that? He sure did. That's pretty important in America, isn't it? Come on, keep looking. He enrolled at Yale just shy of 16. He studied during his senior year with the learned Ezra Stiles, which was Yale's president. Keep looking. Webster lacked, though, firm career plans after graduating from Yale in 1778. So you see when he graduated, 1776, America, Declaration of Independence. Do you see how this man's like right there? He's part of it. He's growing up right now during this thing. See it? But he didn't have good plans. He briefly taught school in Glastonbury. He found the working conditions to be harsh. The pay very low. Then he left to study law. I'll become a lawyer so I can make more money. But he quit. He quit his legal studies. And for a year he lapsed into a deep depression. And he found another practicing attorney that would mentor him. And he completed his studies and he passed the bar in 1781. Pretty good. 
However, the, Re the Revolutionary War was still ongoing. He couldn't find employment as a lawyer. You're just trying to live. You're trying to survive. People are trying to kill you. He picked up a master's degree from Yale. They gave him one for giving an oral dissertation to the Yale graduating class. Must have been pretty good. <laughs> Get you a master's for it. And later that year, he opened a small private school in western Connecticut. Are y'all going to sleep on me yet? Say, all right. He began writing a series of well-received articles from a, for a prominent New England newspaper, justifying, watch this, and praising the American Revolution and arguing that the separation from Britain, say it with me, was what? Permanent. And that's what the Declaration of Independence says. We are free. We are free. God made us free. We'll never be under you again, Britain. Well, this man, not only did he do this in New England, he also was the editor for, for the first paper in New York. This man, Noah Webster. And what beat in his heart was that America is free and will be free. And so that word, that printed word, kept going out to people. Well, he then founded a private school catering to the wealthy parents. This guy's going to make money one way or the other. <laughs> to the wealthy parents in Goshen, New York. By 1785, he had written, say it with me, his, say it with me, speller. He also wrote a grammar book and a reader for elementary schools. Keep looking. We're talking about this man, Noah Webster, a forgotten founding father. So far, so good. That speller he wrote, he wrote this thing called a speller. I thought he just wrote the dictionary. Oh, no, 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 no. He wrote something called a speller. And you'll see it became known as the Blue Back Speller. Say that with me. The Blue Back Speller. Now, as a teacher, Webster had come to dislike American elementary schools. I think we figured that out <laughs> early on. They could be overcrowded with up to 70 children of all ages crammed into a one-room schoolhouse. They had poor underpaid staff, no desk, unsatisfactory textbooks that came from where? I don't think he liked that. Webster thought that Americans should learn from American books, so he began writing. I want you to say that with me. Webster thought that Americans should learn from American books, so he began what? Can we praise the Lord for that? Come on, aren't you glad somebody, somebody <laughs> believed that we are a country and in our country we can do things, we can be great, we can write books, we can be a country now. Thanks to a man like that. So many of the authors, how many, if you've ever written anything, a lot of the credit for your writing anything goes to a man like this. Are y'all hearing me? Amen? Obviously the Lord gets the praise. But this blueback speller, the speller was arranged. He wrote this thing. It was arranged so that it could be easily taught to students. It progressed by age. From his own experiences as a teacher, Webster thought the speller should be simple. Say simple. Well, we need to remember that in church. We get so highfalutin. We get so, oh, I'm so more spiritual. We think talking big fancy words about God. Let me say something to you. Yeah, keep it simple is a pretty good thing. Y'all listen. Come on. I come to church to learn. All right? So Webster thought the speller should be simple and gave an orderly presentation of words and the rules of spelling and pronunciation. So if you can spell today and know how to pronounce things, it's probably because of this joker. Are you hearing me today? Pretty important. He believes students learn most readily when he broke a complex problem into its component parts and had each pupil master one part before moving on to the next one. Well, that sounds like common sense, doesn't it? Well, that's how he wrote this blueback speller. The speller was originally titled the first part of the Grammatical Institute of the English Language. Over the course of 385 editions in his what? Life. Can you imagine 385 different editions in his life? The title was changed to the American Spelling Book. 
and again in 1829 to the elementary spelling book. But most people called it the what? Say it with me, the... You might say, Clark, why are we talking about this on Sunday? You're killing us. Because if you're educated today, and people in our country, we get so arrogant, we get so full of ourselves, we think we're all that. Are you kidding me? It's because people like this who founded not only our country, but believed in, they believed in us, and they believed in a future that we could have. Are you hearing me today? It's incredible. But keep following. Listen. They called it the blueback smelter because of its blue cover. And this is the amazing thing. For the next 100 years, say that with me, 100 years. One more time, 100 years. We're talking from 1800 to 1900. From 1800 to 1900. From 1800 to 1900. Webster's book taught children how to read, how to spell, how to pronounce words. Probably people like Henry Ford and Edison and all the great inventors and all the people that made America great. Who taught them how to read? Who taught them how to learn? Who taught them this? The man's name was who? Noah Webster. I thought he just wrote a dictionary. No, he trained America. He, made, he helped make us great. Are you hearing me today? Noah Webster. I didn't know who was in my second drawer. Wow. He also taught them how to spell and pronounce words. Say it with me, that last line. It was the most popular American book of its time. Only second to the Bible. Hmm. Isn't that crazy? Keep looking. By 1837, it sold 15 million copies. By some... And some 60 million by 1890. Reaching the majority of who? In the nation's what? Its royalty of a half a cent per copy was enough to sustain him for the rest of his endeavors, his writing endeavors. Got a half a cent for every one of those. And it sustained him. Keep looking. Well, when I started this message, I wasn't talking about a blueback speller. I thought I'd be doing the Webster's Dictionary, but I come to find out, my goodness, it was that blueback speller that probably changed America. Amen, don't you agree? Come on. But at the age of 70, say 70. One more time. One more time. At the age of 70, he published his dictionary. And you think you can't do nothing? You owe, you can't do nothing? Are you crazy or what? You can do great things. At the age of 70, he published his first dictionary in 1828, registering the copyright on April 14th. It took Webster 26 years to write it. 26 years to write the dictionary. And can't you tell by his title? An American Dictionary of the What? Because he thought Americans should have books written by who? You think that's important, say? We say made in America today. <laughs> who was the founder of made in America? Noah Webster. He's a guy that thought it was important. Y'all listening or not? Come on! So, he wrote that dictionary which aided in pronouncing vocabularies, uh, vocabularies of Scripture. Now, this is where you've got to really listen. Classical and geographical names. Webster's Dictionary contains 70,000 entries and 12,000 new definitions. Well, that's a big deal back then. For the first time in English-speaking history, English vocab vocabulary words had a standardized spelling. For the first time, for example, for example, center, C-E-N-T-E-R. Well, it was always C-E-N-T-R-E. Theater, T H E P A T, used to be R E, but now it's E R. Theater. We put an E R on the end of words. Er, not re. <laughs> Who did that? Noah Webster. That happened in America, people. Did you understand that or not? 
A lot of the ways you speak and words that you use came because a man, a man thought, you know what, Americans ought to be Americans. You understand? You hear me today? That's not discounting all the other good people and countries of the world. But hey, he was an American first. Amen? You hear me today? Noah Webster. Though it now has an honored place in history of American English, Webster's first dictionary only sold 2,500 copies. Can you imagine his other one sold 60 million or whatever it was? He must have thought, oh my gosh, this thing tanked. He was forced to mortgage his home to develop a second edition, and Webster's life from then on was plagued with the word I hate. Say it with me. Debt. Debt. Can you believe the way you talk today and the education you have today? A man mortgaged his home and was in debt the rest of his life. He could have lived a life of ease with just his royalties from his book, the blueback speller, but he thought you mattered enough. You think God had something to do with all that? Come on. What a great God we have. In 1840, the second edition was published in two volumes. On May 28, 1843, a few days after he had completed revising an appendix to the second edition, and with much of his efforts with the dictionary still unrecognized, say it with me, Noah Webster died. Now, just because he's died, don't you think Gary's done? I know, I saw some of it. Okay, he's done now because he's dead. <laughs> I ain't dead, so I ain't done. Here we go. Come on. Noah Webster served as a soldier in the Revolutionary War. He was elected to the Connecticut General Assembly for nine terms. He's a legislature of Massachusetts for three terms. He also served as a judge. He was largely responsible for Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. If you want to spend some time sometime, go look up Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. And I ain't got time to talk about it. I mean, from, from, from money for education to people bringing things in this country and being able to get money to help with our country's goods and things like that and build this country, you read Section 8. That's crazy what this man was largely responsible for so that you and I could probably have in the future like we have now roads, bridges, schools, all the things that we have, a man like this. I thought he just wrote the dictionary. Oh no. He loved America. He wanted to build America and make America, America. During his tenure in Massachusetts legislature, Noah Webster labored to have funds appropriated for what? Education. Who did that? Why do we have schools today? Why, if you're a teacher, why do you have a job today teaching kids? You know who made that possible? Say his name. Noah who? We know God did it. We know that. But the point is, there was a man who believed in education. Noah declared that government was responsible. Now, a lot of these are going to be quotes now. Government was responsible to discipline our youth in early life in sound maxims of what? Moral, political, and what? Religious duties. That's government's responsibility. But now we say, no, government can't have anything to do with ed education and government. You know, no, 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 in religion. You can't mix no religion in there, nothing like that. He didn't think that at all. That's your job, man, to teach kids morals and about our history and who we are and religion. That's, that's the government's responsibility. It's what he thought, and ain't nobody probably loved America like this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Webster stated the following concerning education. These are some tough quotes, guys. Education is useless without the what? Noah Webster. And today we say you educate without the Bible because you can't educate with the Bible because that's illegal. Noah Webster said educating without the Bible is what? Useless. Oh, he's just nobody. He don't know nothing. Well, he, for 100 years he taught all the Americans in 1890. He wrote the dictionary. Probably smarter than you and me. He said the Bible is America's textbook and all what? People that say today, I don't understand the Bible. The Bible's old hat. You don't know when you say that, you're a fool. And you can quote me. 
You understand? Yes or no? You're an excuse maker. Thank God you weren't back then doing America. We'd be in a hell in a handbasket, wouldn't we? Come on. I know that's hard preaching. God's Word, this is, this is what he said. God's Word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our what? <laughs> he said, I don't need to write a book on that. I already got one. Amen. Y'all listening today? I done made you mad, ain't I? That's how I keep you awake, by the way. <laughs> I got to stay awake to see if he insults me. No, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> you don't want to sleep through that. 1823, Webster wrote his own textbook. It is alleged by men of loose principles or defective views of the subject that religion and morality are not necessary or important qualifications for political stations. But the scriptures teach a different doctrine. They direct that rulers should be men who rule in the fear of God. Able men, such as fear God. Men of truth, hating covetousness. But if we had no divine instruction on the subject, our own interest would demand of us a strict observant of the principles of these injunctions. And it is to the neglect of this rule of conduct in our citizens that we must describe the multiplied frauds, breaches of trust, peculations, embezzlements of public property which astonish even our own selves, which tarnish the character of our country, which disgrace a Republican government, and he ain't said Republican Party, America is a republic, which disgrace a Republican government and which will tend to reconcile men to monarchs in other countries, and if we're not careful, even our what? You listening to this man or not? Noah Webster, come on, brother, preach it. He wrote the following in the preface to his American Dictionary, the English language, otherwise the Webster's Dictionary. This is in the preface. This is what you put in the front. When you see people going to read your stuff, you wanted to read this first, right? In my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. This was in the front of his dictionary. No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intending to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. You think this guy's important? Wow! In 1828, his edition, the American Dictionary, contained a profuse amount of Holy Scripture. If you have a Webster's Dictionary today like mine, it doesn't have the Scripture in it. That's why I use a black Bible and a Webster's Dictionary. You understand? Back in the day, you could have got a whole lot of Bible just from his dictionary. That's how he, he, he described words. He would put Scripture. A profuse amount of Holy Scriptures. He would use verse from the Old and New Testament to clarify the context in which a word was to be used. For example, here's an example. The definition of faith. Belief or conviction. The definition of the word faith includes these following sentences. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Webster's Dictionary. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. We must believe that He is. He's a reward of those that diligently seek Him. For we walk by what? Not by sight. This was in his dictionary that taught America. You listening? For the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We say that here almost every Sunday at Fellowship Church when we close the service. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. In his dictionary. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your what? Faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Hast thou faith? My point is, he used a profuse amount of scripture. Amen? Let's keep moving. He said, I'll hide my, uh, he said, I'll hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no what? No faith. Are you feeling it or not? Are you about to go all to sleep on me? You're like, oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm watching the History Channel. Hey, you better be careful. One day I might be on it. The definition, we already have been. 
we were on it. We were, they did use a copy of us one time, didn't they, Rog? Good. The definition of the word property. Property. We think, and you know, that's mine. I earned it. I made it. It's mine. It's mine. How about the man who wrote the definition of the word? When he wrote it in his dictionary, here's what it said. The exclusive right of, of, the exclusive right of possessing, enjoying, and disposing of a thing. Ownership. In the beginning of the world, the Creator gave to man dominion over the earth, over the fish of the sea, and the fowls of the air, and over every living thing. This is the foundation of man's property in the earth and all its productions. The labor of inventing, making, or producing anything constitutes one of the highest titles to property. It is one of the greatest blessings of civil society that the property of citizens is well secured. Did you see his example of how God is included? Say yes or no. Isn't that pretty cool? What made America great? Because people were thinking like this, reading this, feeling this, believing this. Amen. Say, did I lose you? Come on. The definition of the word providence in that dictionary. The care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. Some persons, listen to this. This is in his dictionary. Some persons admit a general providence, but deny a particular providence, not considering that a general providence consists of particulars. A belief in divine providence is a source of great consolation to good men. By divine providence is understood God himself. You see, when he's writing his dictionary, he's also teaching the scriptures. Are y'all hearing me today? A great American. I just thought he wrote a dictionary. Mine doesn't have all that in it. Well, it's because it's been edited out. Say, edited out. One more time, it's been... Because See, you can't mix religion and education and government and things like that. He was like, I wouldn't know how to write. I think he would say a country won't know how to run. You hearing me today? In 1832, Webster published his history of the United States, in which he wrote his view of government and voting. Now, this is a tad bit long, but I hope you'll listen to this. Government and voting. We don't appreciate government sometimes, and we don't appreciate voting because we didn't make it happen. We just are here. We were born here. Well, he watched all this happen. He watched how precious America is. The brief exposition of the Constitution of the United States will unfold to young persons the principles of Republican government. It is the sincere desire of the writer, that's him in this book, that our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible, particularly the New Testament, or the Christian religion. The religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of who? Christ and His apostles, which enjoins humility, piety, benevolence, which acknowledges in every person a brother or a sister and a citizen with what? Equal rights. This is genuine Christianity. And this we owe our Free constitutions of government. But you can't have government and, and religion. You hearing me today? The moral principles and precepts contained in the Scriptures ought to form the basis of all of our civil constitutions and laws. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. When you become entitled to exercise the right of voting for public officers, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. The preservation of a Republican government, he's not saying Republican Party, a Republican government depends on the faithful discharge of this duty, people. Are you hearing him today, yes or no? If the citizens neglect their duty 
and place unprincipled men in office. The government will soon be corrupted. Now we laugh because it's a mess. Laws will be made not for the public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Yeah, praise the Lord. The guy was right on. One of the biggest things we say when political people run for office now is, hey, you elect me and I'll bring money back home for you. Yeah, I'll bring, you know. What about America? How about if something else matters more than something in our community, you vote no for what we, you thought we needed in our community, what was better for our country? You hearing what? That's what he was saying. And like I said before, it would be crazy to do a survey, a poll, not a survey. Don't do no survey because you, they'd lie. You'd have to get all the data of how many people today in government actually owned a business and ran a business and had to balance a checkbook, had a payroll, understood what debt was. I, I, would, I think we would be astounded. We would be astonished. Crazy. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute the laws if you're not careful. Oops. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men. And the rights of the citizens will be violated or disregarded. Boy, Noah Webster did more than just write a dictionary. Yeah, but remember now, people were listening to him. People were listening to him. And who we are today is because of a guy like this, because he had a pretty big audience. With the New England and the Blueback Speller and the New York paper. If a Republican government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness... It must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men to make and administer the law. Wow! Keep going, Raj. I'm about to die up here. My back's killing me. It's all right. Let's go. His view of the Bible... The Bible is the chief moral cause of all that's good. It's the best corrector of all that's evil in human society. It's the best book for regulating the temporal concerns of men and the only book that can serve as an infallible guide to future felicity or true happiness. He said there's only one book that's truly infallible. It's the Word of the Living God. Not my books, he said. No, 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 no. That book, the Bible. It's extremely important to our nation in a political as well as a religious view, that all possible authority influence and influence should be given to the Scriptures. For these furnish the best principles of civil liberty and the most effectual support of Republican government. The principles of genuine liberty and of wise laws and administrations are to be drawn from the what? And sustained by its authority. The man, therefore, who weakens or destroys the divine authority of that book may be accessory to all the public disorders which society is doomed to suffer. There are two powers only sufficient to control men and secure the rights of individuals and a peaceable administration. Only two. These are the combined force of religion and law or the force of fear and the bayonet. He said, I choose the scriptures <laughs> and law over doing it that way. Amen. He also wrote the following in his dictionary. If the language can be improved in regularity so as to be more easily acquired by our own citizens and by foreigners and thus be rendered a more useful instrument for the propagation of science, arts, civilization, and what? Yeah, he believed in education. He believed in the arts. Are you kidding me? As a boy, he never forgot. I don't want to just hear religion. There's got to be more out there. But he didn't want to do away with it, did he? No. His view of education 
Are we close to the end? Thank you. His view of education. You think we are? For this reason, society requires that the education of youth should be watched with the most scrupulous attention. Education, in great measure, forms the moral characters of men. And morals are the basis of what? Can you say that with me? Morals are the basis of... Here was his views on education. There were five. I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to tell you what they were. Because I know I'm wearing you down. Education should therefore be the first care of a legislature. Not merely the institution, schools, but the furnishing of them with the best men for teachers. Of course, that was back in the day. He certainly would say women today. A good system of education should be the first article of the code of political regulations. For it is much easier to introduce and establish an effectual system for preserving morals than to correct by penal statutes or creating penitentiaries all across the country. And now they're full and running over. We didn't listen to him. Did you hear me? And we're still not listening. And yet the book sits on our desks, in our libraries. Come on. Number three, education. The goodness of a heart is of infinitely more consequence to society than an elegance of manners. Nor will any superficial accomplishments repair the want of principle in the mind. I love this quote. It is always better to be vulgarly right than politely wrong. Can you say that with me? It is always better to be vulgarly right than politely wrong. Or now we say politically correct. Why don't you just tell me the truth? Because you can't handle the truth. Now what Nicholson said? Hey, I want the truth because the truth sets me free. Okay? Number four, the education of youth is an employment of more consequence than making laws and preaching the gospel. Wow. Because it lays the foundation on which both law and gospel rest for success. If we don't train our kids young, right and wrong, and how to do, you think they're going to listen to the Bible? You think they're going to listen to preaching? Boy, you better teach your kids and teach them early. Did you hear him, yes or no? Republican government loses half of its value where the moral and social duties are negligently practiced. To exterminate our popular vices is a work of far more importance to the character and happiness of our citizens than any other improvements in our system of education. Basically, the most important thing you can do is teach kids right and wrong. And they can have all the fancy and the this and the that, but it's all sort of like topping on a cake. There's going to be a problem. Boy, was he ever right. Yes or no? Sure. By taking revenge, I love this quote. I want to have it even though it didn't have a whole lot to do with the message. Webster, by taking revenge, a man is even with his enemy. But by passing it over, he's superior. Can you say that with me? Let's be that kind of church. How about that? Can we say it? By taking revenge, a man is even with his enemy. But by passing it over, he is... There have been a whole lot of people in my life I've wanted to kill. And were it not for the Bible and the grace of God, Gary Clark would be locked up. <laughs> and I learned that the Bible says it this way. Dearly beloved, avenge not ourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, the Lord says. I will repay. Wasn't it a great quote? Maybe you're struggling with an enemy right now. Somebody's done you wrong. I had that happen to me over the last month. Somebody really did me wrong. And all I had to do was tell a couple of my friends, and that guy would have had his tail kicked. I had an amen from behind the curtain. <laughs> but 
vengeance is mine, the Lord says, I'll repay. You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway, it's funny. Some of y'all know, but it's funny. Dina's up there laughing. Dina says, you don't want the pastor to pray against you. <laughs> you don't want it to happen. <laughs> Amen. I love that quote. Though. i got to quit. In 1843, just before his death, now you can know the message is coming to a close. I'm killing him. <laughs> Pete, stop it. <laughs> In 1843, just before his death, Noah Webster publicly professed. You can tell a man by who he is, by what he writes, by what he says late in life, especially on his deathbed. Here's what he said. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Don't worry about me. God's well able. Take care of me. What a good man. The man Noah Webster. A song was written to that verse. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed under him against that Day. Noah Webster. Can we thank the Lord for Noah Webster today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, man. Man, I thought it was pretty good. What too bad? Fellowship meets every Sunday morning at the beautiful Lemon Bay Performing Arts Center, located on the campus of Lemon Bay High School at 2201 Placida Road in Inglewood, Florida. Our early worship service begins at 9 a.m. and the main worship service begins at 10.30 a.m. Between these two worship services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you're looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would like to just pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fellowshipinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.